Thank you for coming. I'm Michael Shalev. I'm a principal program manager with the Graph Security API team inside of C and AI Security. And today I want to tell you a bit about the Microsoft Graph, what it is, why it's important, how you use it, and what's new. Feel free to stop at any point and ask questions or at the end. So let's get started. What the Microsoft Graph is, is really the gateway to all of your data that's in the Microsoft Cloud. Now, the Microsoft Cloud includes Office 365, Windows, Enterprise Mobility and Security, and Azure. What we've been doing over the past several years is trying to consolidate and unify and simplify access to your data. It used to be APIs to access your data, and each time you wanted to add a different data source, you had to learn a new API. What we're doing now is around one model. Um, and this gives you access to identity data, anything in Office. It could be email, it could be documents, it could be connections, um, and so on and so forth. So what does the graph provide you? The graph API provides you access to all your data across Microsoft 65. And moving forward, my group is also extending that to third-party providers from within the graph, and I'll talk a bit more about that at the end. This is good for all types of users. It could be corporate users. It could be educational users. In some cases, even consumer. And the most important message here is there's one way to access it. There is one endpoint. There's one authentication model and key. There's one set, one SDK, and one set of documentation to access your data. What we're doing with the Graph API is actually using it to extend experiences within Microsoft 365 across documents, conversations, pages, timelines. You're aware of Delve and many other ways. You're able to do both this, in other words, extend experiences within Microsoft 365, as well as build and extend these across your own applications. So you do it in the same way with the same API. Moving forward, why is this important? The reason it's important is the reach of Microsoft 365. So 90% of Fortune 500 companies, hundreds of millions of active users in Office 365. It is the largest authentication platform on the planet. There are tens of millions of enterprise mobility seats. It's across the globe. And it's now being extended for collaboration even more. Yesterday, we announced on the second anniversary of Teams that over 500,000 organizations are already using Teams. Remember, you have one API to tap into all of this. OK, so what is in the graph? So Across the different workloads, within Office 365, you have users, groups, organization, Outlook, SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams, Planner, et cetera. Within Windows 10, aside from security, you have activities, commands, notifications. We've just added Dynamics 365 into our public preview, or what we call our beta branch. Enterprise mobility and security gives you access into identity across Azure AD, device management in Intune, Advanced Threat Analytics and Advanced Threat Protection across multiple workloads. At the bottom, you can see other entities that are available within these data sets. Let's talk a bit more about data sets. And this is a preview of something I'm going to discuss in a few minutes in, in what's new and the, the announcements. So in terms of the data sets that you can access, you have Office 365, um, Exchange, OneDrive, and Azure Active Directory. Um, you have the pillar that we work on, which is security, which is across all of the Microsoft security products, as well as third-party security products. And in our pre public preview or beta branch, you have more um, data sets from within Office 365. You have the new financials from uh, Dynamics, um, new uh, risky users, sign-in access review from a, uh, Azure Active Directory, and we're adding and extending um, the Exchange data sets as well. In terms of capabilities, what we've added in the past year is Delta queries. So previously, when you queried the graph, you had to manage um, the data set so you wouldn't repeatedly, repeatedly 
retrieve the same information. Now we support Delta queries across some of the data. We've added webhooks, which are a public, uh, publish, subscribe, a pub sub mechanism. So you can subscribe to notifications on changes to a certain entity or entity type. The way we notify you is what entity was updated and then you retrieve the updated information. Moving forward, um, what I'll talk about in a minute is Microsoft Data Connect, which is very, very important, I believe, to the cloud workloads. Extending the Delta queries across more entities and more data types. Um, Project Roam is cross-device user notifications. And um, for messages, for Microsoft Team messages, we're adding rich webhooks will actually, when you subscribe for changes, push the content as well as notification about what changed. Rather than update this slide, um, I took a snapshot of the um, languages and platforms we support currently. Um, so as you can see across the top, we're going broad. So basically, in whichever language you like to develop, we'll support you. Um, quick starts are prepackaged applications that help you get up and running very, very quickly so you understand how it works. Um, tutorials are what they sound like. And at the bottom, you see the entire S client SDKs that are supported across most of the languages. With Python, um, tutorials and code samples usually suffice. What we are um, working on is a service SDK, but that will be coming out next year. In terms of how we're evolving the SDK, so we're trying to move to a faster cadence and actually re uh, release on a monthly basis. Um, we want to provide the capability to use only the parts that you're interested. So it's one SDK, but to provide more granular um, capability of using certain parts of that SDK. And we're constantly um, expanding the capabilities. For example, batch queries, multi-part queries, as I mentioned, notifications including content, pagination, which currently is, is on the roadmap, and extending the delta queries across all of our content. Um, then we're going down into more native HTTP objects to support pipelines and actually flows of data. And finally, we're moving to a common feature architecture across the different workloads that will support more cross-workload use cases, uh, as well as things like large file uploads, uh, mails with attachments, et cetera. You can get the current state of affairs on any of these options. So we have a blog. There are videos that actually walk through talks on different aspects of the graph. There's a change log, and there's also a monthly community call on the Microsoft Graph. Let's move to getting started. So when you want to get started developing with the Microsoft Graph, there are several ways to do it. The first is to start with the Graph Explorer or the Quick Starts. Um, I'll demonstrate the Graph Explorer in a minute. What it is is it's an application that allows you to write a query or run some predefined queries and then see the results. The results will always be a JSON payload, a JSON document, that include the attributes of the entities that you retrieved. Quick starts, as I said, are prepackaged applications um, around Office 365 that let you get up very, very up and running very, very quickly just to get a feel for things. The next thing is to go to the one set of documentation or API reference. There are two branches, as I mentioned. There's the V1.0 which is the currently released version. And there's the beta branch, which is where we publicly preview new features and, and new data sets, which then um, migrate or actually graduate into V1.0. Finally, you can start developing by using either downloading one of the SDKs or the code samples. We have extensive code samples, and as expected, all of this is available on GitHub. Um, and there are also tools and helper applications to get you up and running. So what is Quick Start? As I said, Quick Start are, is a simple application that runs over um, Identity, OneDrive, and Outlook. And the steps that you need to do to get up and running is really selecting the language or platform of your choice. Clicking on a button, it will register an application and give you an app ID. As I'll explain in a minute, this is necessary for running an application against the graph. Then all you have to do is build a sample in uh, Visual Studio, and then you can sign in and view events on your calendar. So this is a very, very easy way just 
to avoid the frustration of trying to get something working quickly to get a feel for it. And now let's try and move uh, to see the Graph Explorer. So this is the Graph Explorer. Um, I'll sign out and sign in. So the whole access to the graph, as I'll explain in a few moments, you have to be authenticated. There are two ways to do this. You can do it as a signed in user, which is known as delegated, or you can do it as an application. And we use this to run services or daemons against the graph. Um, this is a sample application that you can get to um, either by going to that URL or by going to WACWAC, aka.msge for Graph Explorer. Um, what it does is it will provide a very basic experience for seeing the graph. In this case, I'll sign in um, as an analyst in my demo tenant. The graph by nature is a multi-tenanted application, another service. In other words, you can only access data within your tenant or your organization's data. In addition, as I'll explain in a couple of minutes, there's a process by which you describe the permissions that each application has over that data. And there's also a consent experience that the administrator of that tenant must grant consent to an application. So we want to make sure that while the access to your organizational data is very easy, it's also very secure. So what we see here is my analyst is just logged in. Um, we can look at some sample queries that are um, pre-populated in the Graph Explorer. For example, if you look at the top, what I'm doing is I'm going to graph.microsoft.com v1.0 because we're in the production branch, and I'm just saying me. Under me, by default, it will return my profile from Azure Active Directory. It'll give me my display name, my job title, my mail, et cetera. I'll show you at the end an application built over the graph that actually leverages this to make security operations analysts' job much easier. If we want to look at some of... Um, some of the other options um, that are probably of interest. By going to me, and what me is doing is it's saying, I'm looking at permissions for me as a user. This isn't across all users. That's a different permission, as I'll explain in a couple of minutes. What, what this is able to do is I'm able to say, OK, get me all of my emails. And then what it's actually retrieving down here is all of the emails, or at least the top 200 in my inbox. And what we're seeing here are is the schema of the email that you can look at in the API reference, each of the properties and the property value. So this is how you can very easily extend an application to go over, for example, uh, the titles of a person's emails and create some sort of digest to expose in an application of your choice, or to look for emails from a certain recipient and then group by recipients. Um, it's very easy to use this to do threading of messages if you want to write your own application that accesses the data within um, Office 365. Um, the workload, as I said, that I'm working on is security. So I can do the same thing to get security alerts from within providers of my organization. And here, as you can see at the top, instead of working under me, I'm now working under the security namespace and getting alerts. So previously, it was me slash messages to get my messages for me. Now it's saying, get me the alerts for my organization. Um, as I'll explain a bit later and tomorrow in a dedicated talk on the Graph Security API, there's a, sub, there's a namespace of security within the Graph because we have a federated service running within the Graph that extends beyond Microsoft products. So what you're able to see down here is again, with a very simple query and the OData query language is very straightforward is how easy it is to get rich information about um, any entity that is available in the Microsoft Cloud. So here I can see alerts um, from multiple providers about certain security events that have happened within my, within my tenant. OK, um, another thing that I want to demonstrate how easy it is to do is let's say I want to filter. I want to get a, a subset of those entities. All I have to do is add a filter statement where I'm saying what property am I filtering by and what is the value of that property. Here I'm saying within alerts, just get me high severity alerts. Now I can concatenate criteria and actually form whichever query I want to do. And since everything is in the same API using the same auth model, 
I can do these kind of filtered queries across workloads. So I can do it across Azure Active Directory and Office 365. And it's very easy to actually form the data set that I want to retrieve and expose within my application. I want to talk a bit about authorization, authentication and authorization. So the Microsoft Graph is built over OAuth 2.0. And for every application or every access via an application to data within the graph, what happens is the application which is registered um, in Azure Active Directory actually has the permissions or claims defined within that application registration. Every time you try and access it, what happens is it goes up to Microsoft Identity, it, auth it authenticates the user within that app and returns the claims within a token that claim within the access token is then sent to the Microsoft, uh, the Microsoft Graph, where it is um, authorized against the application, and the results are returned. I'm going to talk about this a bit more in terms of the how we register an application. In terms of app types and permissions, I alluded to this earlier. One way we can access um, information is on behalf of a signed-in user. In other words, I'm a user within an organization. My um, tenant administrator has authorized an application to expose data to users and added whatever restrictions on the set of users that can access that data. So what happens now is it can be any type of application. It can be a, a web application, a mobile application. It makes no difference because the authentication model always runs up to identity and then into the Microsoft Graph. And what happens in, in delegated permissions are the oval that we see on the left are the permissions that the administrator has granted to that application within the delegated permission model. So if, as we'll see in a second, there are two, um, two options for applications to, to run an auth model. The first is the delegated, the second is as an application only. I can define different permissions for each of the types, okay? In addition to that, when the user is authenticating to AAD, to identity services, it's applying whatever privileges that user has, and the privileges or the permissions that user will have within the application is really the intersection of those two. For example, within the, security, uh, the Graph Security API, for user delegated mode, we've added a restriction that only limited administrators of type security reader or security administrator can access security data because it's very, very sensitive data. What this means is any other user that does not have that Azure Active Directory role that tries to sign in will be dropped. Whereas if they sign into an application that accesses their email, they will be granted uh, access to that application and to, that data, and to those data. Um, when we're talking about me, about my data, the user can consent. In other words, there's a first time consent experience where consent has to be granted to that application. If it is for broader information than one user, that consent has to be granted by the administrator. So in terms of securing your data, there's a permissions model, but even after that permissions model has been um, defined, there's a first time case where the administrator has to grant consent for that application to access the data subject to those permissions. Get access as a service. Um, this is for any application that wants to run within a service account or as a daemon. Um, in security, we have uh, a lot of PowerShell scripts that are running and pulling in events for automation. This would be one of those situations where um, for a ongoing service, you don't necessarily want a signed in user. Usually it will be a service account or a daemon. In this case, there are only the app permissions because there is no signed in user or user profile to um, do that sort of um, Venn diagram against. And when you authenticate as an application, you have to provide the application secret, which is generated when you register that application in the Azure portal. Let's talk a bit about permissions. Some of you know this is claims. So the way permissions work in the graph are you have a resource on that resource, you're defining a certain action. And finally, you're defining the scope of that action. So if we look at, um, at me or at mail, 
that would be the resource. So the user could be the resource, and that would be me. Then I can assign it either read, read, write, write action permission. And finally, I can say, if I don't define anything, then it's only to that user. In other words, if I just say um, mail.read, that means under me messages, I'll be able to read my messages. If I try and access some other user by user ID, I won't be able to. On the other hand, if I specify mail.read.all, and this is something that only an administrator can grant consent for, I'll be able to provide a user ID and then do the same messages thing. Okay, so this is for an application in which I want to go across users, and we can, we'll see a couple of uh, examples of that. And there we're defining the scope of the users or the entities that will be subject to that permission. We've been making great efforts to try and simplify the experience for developers and for users. This is the previous um, experience. So you could register an application in Azure Portal. You could register it under apps.dev.microsoft.com. Um, and you could also um, define it within a blade within the Azure portal. These were running over two authentication libraries. The first was the Active Directory authentication library, and the second, or ADAL, and the second was the Microsoft authentication library, or, or MSAL. To support these, there were two versions of endpoints, and you had to be either v1 or v2. If you're using ADAL, you're working over a v1 endpoint and using a v1 token. If you're working over MSAL, you're using a V2 endpoint and a V2 token. If you wanted to use both, you had to stand up two endpoints. Um, and the audience, the target audiences for that were, um, again, separate. So MSAL could access Azure AD, Microsoft Authentication, and Azure AD B2C. Um, ADAL could also um, access um, ADFS, which is Azure Dire uh, Active Directory Federation Services. So to try and make life simpler, we're moving to the following model. Everything happens in the Azure portal because that's where you go anyway. All of our future investments are based on the Microsoft Authentication Library simply because it has a broader footprint. And V2 endpoints now support both V1 and V2 tokens. So that means that all investments should go into standing up V2 endpoints because then you do it once. If you have anything legacy running over ADAL, we'll still support the V1 tokens. Again, if you have existing ADAL developments over ADFS, we can support that still. Although, as I said, our future investments are going to be within um, the green border. And there you can see that through Azure AD, we can still support ADFS if you want to work through MSAL. Okay, this is important because when you're developing your application, you have to use one of the authentication libraries in order to authenticate to the graph. So let's talk about our future investments in MSAL. Given the broad spectrum of languages we want to support, we're rolling out authentication, client authentication um, libraries to support all of, those, um, all of those languages. So JavaScript, AngularJS, .NET, Universal, uh, UWP, Android, iOS, and Xamarin. Um, these, as I said, these will be migrating from um, beta into V1. The more feedback we get, the faster we can migrate, we can actually graduate them into V1.0. And so please, if you are developing, try and take use of all of these. I want to go through, and here I'll just go through screens so I don't scroll up and down, um, what the app registration experience or flow is like, because this is going to be the first place where you start working with the graph, and this is the place that you would want to get it right the first time, simply to avoid frustration. So you, to register your app, you log into portalazure.com. Um, Given that we um, support ISVs, there are actually two account types you can support. So you can say, as an ISV, I want to resell my application across organizations, and therefore I want to be a multi-tenanted application, and I will share the app ID with my different customers. 
Another option is for each tenant admin to register an app ID for that application, be it first party, be it self-developed or third party. Okay, so you just have to decide which account type you want to support. Um, you can add a redirect URI, so following authentication, where is it redirected to? In web applications, this is important because that will be the landing page. And as we'll see, as we actually saw when I went into the Graph um, Explorer, I clicked on authentication, I went into the Microsoft Authentication Experience where I selected the identity, and that redirected me back to the Graph Explorer with the token so I could then start working. And finally, you click register, and that will actually generate your app ID. It will also, register, it will also generate an app secret that is exposed once, and then it is forever masked. And app secrets are best stored within the Azure Vault, the Azure Key Vault. Um, you, can re you can regenerate uh, an app secret if you need to, if you lost uh, the previous version. The second part is deciding on what auth model are you using. Is this going to be a user delegated application where users sign in or granted permissions? Or is this going to be a daemon or an app only um, authentication model? And then you will um, select the permissions and um, in the Azure portal you'll see Graph API, you click on that and you see an endless list of all of the different um, resources that are available. You can select a resource, and then as we saw earlier, define the action. Is it read? Is it read write? And finally, what scope is it? Is it um, unspecified and therefore only the signed in user, or is it dot all? And then it's across users. Um, for example, users dot read dot all and security events dot read write dot all. Um, I'll show you an application running over these permissions at the end. Um, and then finally, if, it, if you are in application mode, then you will generate the application secret. And as I mentioned earlier, application secrets are best stored in the Azure Key Vault. Okay, we're doing well on time. Um, so let's look at the ways um, that, micro, that developers are using Microsoft Graph. Um, the primary way today is real-time access to data. So I'm generating, as we saw in the um, Graph Explorer, I'm generating a query, I'm retrieving data, filtered data sets in real time. The consent models, as we saw, are defined in the permissions in Azure Portal. And security and compliance are always within the compliance boundaries of my organization's data. Um, tomorrow, when I talk about the Graph Security API, we'll see how that is enforced despite the fact that we are talking about third-party services being included in the queries. Okay, so Contosa Airlines, what I'm gonna show you is a um, very, very simple app built over um, SharePoint and Teams. What it's going to simulate is how an airline can manage a flight in terms of who, is, um, who the pilots are, uh, and the attendants, et cetera and if there are any changes like the gate, et cetera, these will be then automatically populated to um, the team's accounts of, or the team's channels of those people. So we've predefined the flows. The previous session was about flow. I'm not going to go into defining those again. Um, what I will do is I'll define a new, um, a new flight in SharePoint. Um, just to show you, the last flight is 693 in Teams. And that is this flight. So let's create a new flight. Um, we'll make this flight from Seattle to Amsterdam. Whoops, I'm the caps lock, so let me change that back. Seattle to Amsterdam, the flight number will be 675. The admin will be my administrator. Um, our pilots today will be Christy Klein and Ellen DeYoung. Disregard the fact that they're really admins, etc. Our attendance will be Alex and Miriam. Our Catering liaison will be Outlook 
Dev Center. Okay, and our departure gate will be A19. We just define our flight to leave today. And let's change it to leave at 12 p.m. Okay, now I'll save it. Now let's go over into um, Teams. And now the flow is running in the background. And what we should see in a minute is that it will create a new team for that flight. I never know how long this takes, so we'll wait together. And may the demo guides be with me. Here we go. So flight 675 was created. Um, it starts with a general channel. In a second, it will add a second channel. So one more channel. Let me go back here. Okay, so it already added general, a channel for our flight attendants and pilots. Um, and now let's go back for a second. Let's select our flight. Let's edit it and let's change the gate from A19 to B84. Save that. Hop directly back into Teams and wait for a change to propagate. So the first flow was when I define a new flight, create a new team with the people that are involved in that. And the second was if anything is updated, push notification to each of the channels of the different um, users. And as I said, I never know how long this takes. So let's look at general. You are welcome to this flight. And let me just check that I saved to make sure. Yes. And now we'll wait with bated breath for this propagation, for the change to propagate. Or not. There we go. The demo worked. Small applause because it actually worked. Thank you. Okay, let's talk about the next big thing. So, until now the graph was great. We had real-time access. We could access data sets within um, the Microsoft Graph, write an application that would then do these filtered queries, write flows. It could be logic apps, it could be flow, it could be power apps. It could be my own automation that actually just calls into the API, which is basically a REST API. But when we ta start talking about insight and analytics, we're talking about a completely different magnitude of operation because we're talking about big data and we're talking about cloud analytics. And so what we need to do to support the level of applications that are now going to run over insight and analytics is move to data at scale. So we're talking about all of the email for my organization and I might have a 100K seat organization. We're talking about granular consent to data. So I don't necessarily want to expose all of the data within my exchange account. I might, uh, for example, um, if I want to write a social graph for my organization, just look at senders and recipients. So I can define the fields that will then create the data tables in Azure and then run analytics over that. I also want to apply more um, granular security and control over that data. And finally, I want to make sure that whatever I do remains within the security and compliance boundaries of my organization. So Microsoft Graph Data Connect is the answer to this. It's a new data platform. And what it allows you to do is actually define or select from within data sets in Office 365 
across your organization. The granular consent, as I said, I can select certain fields or certain columns within that data. At origin, the data is within my Office 365 um, domain and compliance boundary. All of this is running within my Azure subscription, therefore it remains within my compliance boundary. And then what we can do is we can run these over customer data, we can add product data, we can add industry data, we can add all of the data that's available within Azure or from within Azure, add this to these workloads, um, and define rich applications. One example of this is Microsoft Delve. In Microsoft Delve, you can actually, for your organization, which is what we do, see what documents I'm working on, what team I'm in, what documents my team is working on, other people working on the same documents, et cetera. So you can develop very, very rich applications based on a subset of the data within each of these data sets. As I said, beginning with users, messages, calendar events, mailbox settings, contacts, et cetera. And then um, look for trends. Who am I um, most in contact to or of the people that I'm in contact with? Who haven't I been in touch with over the past month? You can think of applications that sort of remind you to stay in touch with your network. Ways we see customers using these are um, customer engagement um, in terms of, even within my organization, if there's someone who knows about a topic that I'm interested in learning more about, trying to identify who that person is and put me in touch with them, it could be part of the digital transformation in terms of how I manage my organization. So what we're doing here is we're taking all of the, organizations, all of the organization's data that is stored within the Microsoft Cloud, and we're actually allowing you to hook it up easily to Microsoft, to Azure Analytics and ML, or machine learning, and then define applications that take advantage of those insights. So you're not limited to working at the raw level of the data. Um, an example of how you could build an organizational social graph over this is again, from the M365 data, we can take uh, either from Exchange or also Exchange and Teams, figure out um, or import the data that are the senders and recipients from all of my users' inboxes or who am I chatting with in Teams I import those into Azure Data Factory. I then store them as blob storage of the table of those columns. And then I can run cognitive services or any workload, Databricks, any of the analytics workloads within um, Azure that I want to, and then store it in a Cosmos DB, for example, and then expose it via web app. So what we're doing is making the process very, very well-defined, easy to use, while enforcing all of the security and compliance that is necessary to organizational data. Okay, we have lots of time, and so I'll go into something that I'm going to be discussing tomorrow in more depth, which is actually um, a service and application written over um, the Graph API, um, including over the Graph Security API. Um, what we've done here is we've devel developed sample uh, security operations application, which gives a dashboard of what's happening across my organization in terms of all of the alerts across all of the products that I currently license. This is written entirely over the Graph API and the Graph Security API. Um, since as an API, we don't have a UI, and we don't have a, um, a customer-facing product, this is actually sample code, and it will be uploaded to GitHub the end of this week. Um, so basically everything we do over the graph, um, we, upload, we then upload to GitHub and make available as sample code for developers and customers to use either as examples to get up and running very quickly, or actually they can even fork off of this. Um, what we're able to see here is um, what I'm doing at the top, and remember earlier I said slash security slash alerts, get me all the alerts. So I get all of the alerts. I now have that data set as, as a standard set of JSON documents. I can now slice and dice it. So I can say, okay, I want to know how many are new, how many are being treated, how many are already resolved or closed, which are the donuts you see at the left. 
Um, I can then further expose how many of them are high severity, medium severity, low severity, because usually high severity is a bit more interesting than low. I can then look inside and say, okay, which user accounts are mentioned there? So user principal name or email addresses. And actually what we're doing here is I'm taking that user principal name. I'm doing a separate call into the Azure Active Directory for the user, and I'm showing you their display name. So the security applications actually never see a user's display name because that's information that they're not exposed to. What you're able to do with the graph in a very simple way, and I'll show you an even richer experience in a minute, is do mashup and actually get one, uh, one property, pivot on that, call into a different service within the graph using that as an identifier, retrieve other properties of that entity, here the user display name, and actually use that uh, to display. At the bottom, what we see at the bottom left, what we're seeing is a different service within Microsoft 365 Security and Compliance, which is called Secure Score. It's also exposed via the Graph API, the Graph Security API. And so actually I'm taking data from three or four sources here, mashing it all up into this universal dashboard. The nice thing that you can see on the right is that while the majority of security products on here are Microsoft, at the top you see Palo Alto. So what we've done as part of the graph is set up a federation service that allows an external provider to stand up a graph endpoint in Azure, supporting the same auth model and the same tokens. What I do is the user queries into the graph, we federate that query onto all of their licensed providers. A provider that accepts this supports the authentication model, supports OData, maps it onto their backend data. If they have anything to reply, they then reply. So let's look a bit deeper and see what we're able to do by virtue of the graph. So as I said, the basis of the graph, one API, one auth model, and for any property, I can generate what you see at the top are the, the actual query that I just ran. So if you're running it through the SDK, I'm saying filter by user state's user principal name is Douglas F at M365, which is my tenant. Um, the rest query is below that. And what I just did was I said, okay, I'm a security analyst. I see a user with a lot of alerts and I'm afraid they, their identity may have been compromised. What I'm able to do is I'm able to send out one query saying, get me all of the user's alerts. You can easily see this as saying, get me all of the user's emails, documents accessed, chats, et cetera. So you're able, because the graph supports the same data models and the same identifiers, you're able to take a given identifier like user principal name, call out into multiple workloads, bring all the results back and do a mashup. Um, what we see here is a list of all of the alerts for that user. Um, as I'll explain tomorrow, it actually tells the story of, a, of an attack on the organization. What I want to show you now is what the power that the graph enables you within your applications to do. So what I did was um, I clicked on an alert that was generated by Palo Alto Networks. I just timed out, so I'll remember the authentication experience. I'm now authenticating to Microsoft, to MSAL. It's redirecting me back to the Graph Security API. And what we see here is an alert that was generated by a network appliance. My firewall, my network firewall caught a, uh, a network connection to a suspicious URL. It saw within there an email account, which is um, the user principal name. What I'm able to do is I can take that data that I got from a third party and actually go into Azure Active Directory, pull in the user profile, get the user's picture, see what their title is, where they sit, who their manager is, how I can contact them. If, for example, I saw that this was alert was generated in, um, um, in Australia, but I know the user sits in Redmond in Seattle, I can immediately reach out to the user and say, have you gone, are you now in Australia? Were you there, were you not there? If he's not there, then I know with, with pretty high certainty that his identity may have been compromised, okay? So this is an example of how within one place within my application, I can pull in data from 
completely different work so, uh, data sources and provide a unified picture that is understandable to my user. So context in this, in this world, context is everything. So if I know that an alert is an engineering lead versus the president or the CFO of a company, the context, that knowledge of what their job title is can change the whole way I look at, a, at an incident. In terms of the, the broader graph, if I want to create a, a community of users based on common interests with analytics, I can now do, um, write, a, write a, a, an analytic that looks for shared interest or documents um, with shared topics. And then I can create a virtual community and I can expose it within my application to the different users and actually start creating experiences that were previously not available. Um, another one of the things that we're able to do by virtue of the graph, um, and this I wasn't able to show you in the previous ones, at the top right you see manage alert. So most of what we've been seeing now has been uh, um, downstream. In other words, we were retrieving data from the graph. What you're able to do here is you're able to actually update, create updates in the graph. And therefore, in the application where previously I did it in SharePoint for, the, uh, for Contoso flights, I can actually write this cute little mobile app, and I'm able from the mobile app to update the gate, go through the graph. If I want to use the existing flow, I'll just call into SharePoint, into that entity, and I'll update the gate. And then I'll run the whole flow from completely within a mobile app that I can then share on any mobile device. Questions? All right. Um, one other thing I wanted to show. Are there any subscriptions? Okay. Um, as I said earlier, there is a place within Office 365 Security and Compliance called Secure Score. What we're doing here by via the graph is actually calling in, getting data to show a, a high level of the current score. In other words. What Secure Score does is it tells me my organizational's security health or posture based on the policies I have and the enforcement of those policies. So, for example, um, the second item we see on the list down here is require multi factor authentication for privileged roles like domain admins. So, I want to make sure that uh, anyone who is a domain admin in my organization, every time they log in, they're using multi factor authentication so they don't write their password down somewhere and lose it and someone finds it. So what we're doing here is we're actually, by uh, using the API, calling into Secure Score, and we're able to expose an experience that is from their portal in whichever application we want to. We all, will always provide a backlink, so if I want to go and work within that portal, I can see uh, protection.office.com, I click on that, I'm taken into their portal, and I can do more granular stuff. But what this shows you is how you're able to build a an application that is logical and makes sense in terms of a story that you want to walk your user through, but it might actually be calling into multiple workloads. As far as the user is concerned, it's seamless. As far as you're concerned, you're using the same auth key, you're using the same language, the same SDK, and the same endpoint. So the simplification that we're doing for the user of this merged experience, we're extending to developers. Because trying to learn each product's API that then changes is a nightmare. We've listened, we've changed, and hopefully um, after this session you'll all run out and start writing graph-enabled applications. So next steps. Graph Explorer, as I said, it's very easy to remember. It's aka.ms slash GE. Um, you can then start either with a tutorial or a quick start, very, very easy to. Um, you can also go into the graph and just look at the different um, code samples that are there. All the code samples there are working applications that have undergone code reviews, so um, we're, we're comfortable with sharing them. And for certain workloads, they may save you a lot of work in terms of patterns and frameworks. And you can follow us on any of the uh, social media um, options, Twitter, GitHub, Stack Overflow. Um, there is also something called Tech Communities. And within Tech Communities, 
there is a, a graph community and a graph security API community with channels for um, providers, for general users, et cetera. Thank you.